Welcome to this lecture on Egyptian landscapes. Um, this will be lecture four. We're going to be taking a look at um, the geography of Egypt as well as the resources that you see in Egypt to try to understand the land and the environmental context in which Egyptian culture was created. In the beginning, there was nothing except the primordial waters of the universe. It was dark, and in the darkness, there was a mound called the Ben-Ben. The Benu bird flew over the waters and called forth creation, and out of the darkness and out of the water, the god Atum created himself on the mound. He spoke his own name into existence. That's at least the story that Egyptians tell about the physical creation of the world, or at least one of the stories, because the Egyptians tell lots of stories about how the world came to be, and they're not all consistent. This mound is represented in lots of different ways throughout Egyptian culture. The tops of pyramids, uh, what's called the pyramid capstone, or the tops of obelisks, which are tall, very skinny looking pyramids that we'll be talking a lot more about later. Both of these have a cap that represents in many ways this mound um, of the primordial waters and the object rising up out of it. Um, the Bennu bird um, has been considered to be possibly an inspiration for the phoenix, um, but here shown more looking like a heron of sorts um, in this particular Egyptian illustration. Let's talk a little bit more about Atum and figure out um, how he makes the world as the Egyptians knew it. The divine nine, or the Ennead, in Egyptian that's Pesejet, those are the gods and goddesses brought forth by Atum as he creates himself. A tomb being self-created in these primordial waters, uh, Nun, or Nu, spits out two additional gods. In one of the myths, it says that he masturbates, and that's how this all happens. So a tomb, I like the spitting out version better because it makes sense um, in terms of the, what these two gods are called. Um, and it's a little bit of a play on words. Spit out, well, the two gods that he spits out are Shu and Tefnu. Shu is air. <sighs> kind of suggests spitting, doesn't it? Or something proceeding out of the mouth. And Tefnu is moisture. So here is uh, Shu on top and then Tefnu on the bottom. Shu and Tefnu have two children, and they are Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. So we've got self-created Atum, followed by air and moisture, and then an earth and a sky separated. So here is Geb and Nut. Geb and Newt get together and give us four more children. They are Osiris and Isis who get married. They're a couple. Osiris is the lord of the underworld, so the lord of death, though he's associated with lots of different things. I mean, he's a god. He can do more than one thing. And then Isis, um, the goddess of magic, and many other things as well, particularly funerary kinds of things. After all, her husband is the Lord of the Dead. 
And then there are two more sets of gods. Um, they are Set or Seth, who is the god of disorder, of the desert, of chaos, and his wife, Nephthys, um, who is the goddess of the night, but lots of other things as well. So to the average ancient Egyptian, this is one of the many stories they told themselves about how the world came to be. The world that they inhabited. And in many ways, that was a remarkable world that favored one of the most powerful and rich cultures to ever develop in the ancient world. So let's look at that landscape that emerged out of the primordial waters. Let's look at the way the Egyptians understood their landscape and what they got out of it to make one of the most enduring um, and fascinating civilizations in the history of the world. Water is at the core of the Egyptian world. Um, not just the primordial waters of Nun, but the Nile itself because you cannot have an Egypt without the Nile. The Egyptians didn't call it the Nile, they called it Iteru, the river, because it's the one river that you have, so you're not gonna come up with names for it. It's, everybody knows this is the river. Um, in the fall, between September and January, starting sometimes in July, August, um, the Nile begins to rise. As it rises, the volume of water increases and it brings with it lots of dirt flowing down the river towards the Mediterranean. The Egyptians called this Akhet. This is the season of the rising of the Nile. Between January and May, the Egyptians would sow their crops now that the waters have settled down and they have left a rich black soil behind. This is the season of parrot, which you can plant and raise some food. Between May and August, that's when you could harvest, or the Egyptians called the shamu. So it's interesting if you think about um, the Egyptian worldview here being created by this river, the river, and it fosters in them three seasons to divide their world into three seasons. Think about how many seasons you experience and how it came to be that you believe those are distinct markings of time in the calendar of the year. The Egyptians also looked at the Nile as a deity. And one of the things we're gonna see is there are quite a few deities in ancient Egypt. Um, the god of the Nile flood was Hapi. Hapi made Egyptians happy when the rich soil that flooded helped create um, the kind of environment needed for raising good crops. If there wasn't enough of the flood, then you're gonna starve to death. If there's too much of the flood, then it's gonna destroy a lot around it. So it's quite important to them um, that Hopi oversee this flooding in a way that is gonna make Egypt prosperous because the land along the river where the black soil rests, Kemet, will have agriculture. And that is very distinct from the red lands beyond or Deshret, where there is nothing green growing. And you can see from the picture just how distinct the two areas are, that the Nile creates the uh, prosperity of Egypt in very serious contrast to the dry desert on either side. Um, those are the hieroglyphs for Itaru, the river. You can see the sign here for water. 
indicating how to interpret iteru. Here is a quote from the Hymn to the Nile composed um, in the middle portion of Egyptian history, somewhere around 2025 BCE, thereabouts. Hail flood emerging from the earth, arriving to bring Egypt to life. This hymn goes on and on and on and on and talk about what the Nile does and how important it is. One more thing to take note of. You see this rocky outcrop in the middle here and this little rock portion here and here um, towards the top of the picture. These are called cataracts. Um, they are blockages, rocky blockages in the Nile itself. Um, and there's a whole series of these cataracts in the southern portion of Egypt that become very important um, for where Egyptians will set up forts um, as they try to both trade with and conquer the people to the south of them. So uh, keep in mind, the Nile is just not one giant river all the way through. Um, it does have these little rocky spots um, that uh, the Egyptians have to get around. And we're also gonna see these little rocky spots produce something important. The Nile is quite a long river, um, over 6,600 kilometers, 4,000 miles. You can see the roots of it go all the way into Central Africa, Lake Victoria area down here. And that produces what is known as the White Nile, the White Nile branch. Um, the Blue Nile um, originates in what today is Ethiopia, and they unite together at um, Khartoum here on the map. The Blue Nile actually produces the volume of water that's necessary for ancient Egypt to survive. It's about 80% of the water and the silt um, come from the Blue Nile. Um, unfortunately today, or fortunately today, because it depends on how you see it, um, this silt no longer travels downstream and covers the banks. Um, so the flood has been stopped. Why? The Aswan High Dam, uh, which is a little hard to see, but is built right here, um, was built in 1970 um, to help control water cycles in Egypt to prevent massive flooding, to hold back water when there's too much, to release it when you need more. Um, so Egyptian farmers are still prosperous. Um, they use artificial means to uh, fertilize their lands, uh, and they have a steady control over the water supply now. Um, but they do lose that distinctive flooding, that black chemet that's created by the annual flood cycle. Um, the god of the flood is known as um, Hopi, and pictured here on the right. Um, he is shown, of course, supporting all the, the bounty, the foliage that is necessarily for life. Notice he's also got some very feminine features. Um, he has breasts. And in a lot of places, Hopi is described in very feminine terms that somehow he's mothering Egypt um, by the production of the Nile flood. And indeed, um, he does. So the Egyptians are very appreciative when the flood works out the way it's supposed to. In the end, all of this spills out in the delta, this fan-shaped end to the Nile um, on the Mediterranean Sea, where the Egyptians silt and deposits over thousands of years helped create this extremely rich and extremely fertile area. It's very marshy in ancient Egyptian times, very wet. And we'll be talk more, talking more about the kind of sites and civilizations that appeared here, the cultures that appeared here um, thousands and thousands of years ago. Notice too from this map, 
just how amazingly green everything around the Nile is. Egypt is literally, as um, the Greek historian Herodotus said, the gift of the Nile. So what does the Nile do for Egypt? Um, well, certainly agriculture is important. It's a very convenient means of travel and trade. Um, the, the Egyptians do not hide in Egypt as we kind of once thought. We thought they were sort of isolated and, and they just stuck to themselves. But in fact, um, they do travel. They do trade quite a bit. Nubia to the south, the Sinai Peninsula, um, Lebanon, Syria, even as far away as Afghanistan, they get trade goods. Um, prize materials that they want and like. It's quite easy for the Egyptians to uh, move about Egypt when your country is narrowly confined to the side of a river. Um, it's not a huge country at all. I mean, it looks huge because we're used to thinking of Egypt as sort of like a square in the corner of Africa. But really, in the time of the ancient Egyptians, it's just whatever is along the river. So we find very early on, very early on in Egyptian society, lots of references and images of boats. Um, this is a boat um, from near the Great Pyramid, Khufu's Pyramid. So uh, this boat's roughly about 2500 BCE. Um, there were boat burials even before um, in another town in Egypt called Abydos. Um, you can even see way before that um, a painting of boats in a tomb at a uh, town in Egypt called Hierakonopolis. Hi Hierakonpolis, sorry. I always tongue twist that up. Um, and that's from about 3400 BCE. Um, here's a picture of that tomb painting from tomb 100. And what do we have? Boats. So the Egyptians really do have a lot that they get from the Nile um, for travel, for trade. They grow wheat. They grow flax, um, which they use to make linen. They harvest papyrus, which they even can use to write texts. Um, they catch quite a bit of fish. The Nile even flooded a basin um, called the Fayum um, and created a lake where an archaeologist, Gertrude Catton Thompson, excavated in the 1920s and found settlements dating to uh, 4400 B.C., around that time period. Um, the Fayum cultures that she found um, were farming and enjoying the blessings of the water flooding and creating um, rich farmlands. They were producing pottery and weaponry. Um, they were taking flax and making linen uh, for their clothing. And I'll show you an example of what she found on an upcoming slide. So this is the Fayum Basin. Um, the Nile River you can see here had a little bit of branch that flowed off. Um, and that branch helped feed a very large lake in ancient times. It's a lot smaller now. We know that several kings right around about 1990 BC, actually tried to widen the waterway um, to tr try to create a more um, useful storage area for water in the case that they might need it um, if the floods were pretty low. Um, and here all in the Fayum were um, Gertrude Catton Thompson um, excavated she found uh, examples of pottery. She found uh, weaponry. She found these 
sort of baskets that were embedded in the ground, um, which uh, she suggested were probably for the storage of, graining, uh, for, of grain. Um, and of course, linen is an example here at the top. Um, it does not look very comfortable to wear, but you know, you try having your clothes survive several thousand years. Um, the Egyptians prized quality linen, and so it's going to become a, an incredibly important fabric in their society. So Egypt has more than just water, um, and that's quite important to the Egyptians. Um, but what it doesn't have, they also will go trade for. Um, so they get copper, for example, to make tools. Um, in the desert regions in the Sinai Peninsula, the Egyptians can uh, find copper, mine for copper. Um, they love gold. So uh, the deserts uh, in some places. And to the south, um, the area known as Nubia also has uh, fairly rich supplies of gold the Egyptians are interested in. Stone, incredibly important because think about how much we know about Egypt because they were such monumental builders um, and they left behind so many temples and tombs. Um, well, they needed stone for doing that. Probably the most common building stone for um, something that's gonna be more permanent um, is going to be limestone, and you can get that right off the cliffs of the Nile. So along the Nile Valley, green, 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 right up to the edge where the cliffs and the hills begin, um, ready supplies of limestone. Granite, um, a much, much more uh, hard stone to work with, uh, came from southern portions of Egypt near those cataracts uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, one such place was Aswan um, near the first cataract. This was a very often used in tombs. Um, so um, the burial sarcophagi, the, essentially the coffins of the ancient Egyptians, uh, very wealthy ancient Egyptians like the kings, would be made of granite. Um, as well as other hard stones. And granite comes in a variety of colors, so it could be a very, very useful stone to make a statement. Um, the Egyptians had access to flint or chert for tools that they could chip and then turn into um, arrowheads and other weaponry. But the most common building material <laughs> is also the one that makes it very hard to know a lot about the ancient Egyptians, mud. Um, mud brick, very readily available from the banks of the Nile um, because you can just go and you know, pull up a chunk of clay and dirt. You could make bricks, harden them, and build a pretty quick building uh, very quickly, um, but it's not very durable. Um, over time, the bricks degrade. Farmers in the um, 18th and 19th century often like chopped up the, the bricks and used them as, as fertilizer when they found piles of these um, messy bricks. Early archaeologists weren't interested in them because they weren't huge monuments and pyramids and things like that. So who cares about a brick? Um, sometimes we do have some mud brick um, that survives and gives us an example of what you know, an Egyptian house was like. Uh, one example from an archeological archeolo sur site survived because the house burned, and so it fired the mud bricks and made them a lot harder. So limestone at the top, granite in the middle. Look at that pretty pink and black in the granite. You see why the Egyptians really liked granite, um, and then chert or flint at the bottom. The Egyptians were not limited to just the Nile Valley and the, you know, the immediate desert areas surrounding because there were cuts through the cliffs on the side of the Nile. Um, and these cuts were 
um, ancient riverbeds. Um, Africa was not always a dry place. It went through periods where it was very wet and then dry and got wet again. Um, and these dried up riverbeds, these places that cut through the, the cliffs on the side are called wadis. Um, the, the wadis often led to either the sea, if you're going towards the Red Sea, um, or to mines and minerals that the Egyptians highly prized. The most famous that we'll be talking about um, a little bit more later on is the Wadi Hammamat. Um, it's quite important because um, it was uh, en route to the Red Sea. Um, there was mining activity done there, and we find lots of evidence of the very most ancient Egyptians traveling back and forth in these wadis, leaving inscriptions and carvings as they went. Some of the very, very, very foundational images in Egyptian history appear in these wadis. Um, it's also important because we have a map of it. Um, in about 1150 BCE, a scribe named Amenacht um, created a map of the Wadi Hammamat. It's one of the world's oldest maps. So it's a pretty interesting document to have, to have someone show you exactly what to find as you're going down the Wadi Hammamat um, to the Red Sea. This is what it looked like. You can see um, you know, the, the dry riverbed cut through the cliffs. Um, it looks a very forbidding place to be. But the Egyptians absolutely valued what they got out of these wadis. And the Wadi Hamimat is just littered with texts and drawings um, along its sides as you go. And look, even boats. See how important boats are? So that has been our introduction to the geography and environment of ancient Egypt. And uh, next, we'll be turning our attention to the prehistoric cultures of ancient Egypt. See you in the next lecture.